picture with me, if you will, the start of something new. A new semester. A new day. A new job. A new treatment. A new sermon. A new marriage. A new life. We have all, at one point or another, been there. We've all had to start something new. We can't avoid it, no matter how much we try to hide away in our caves, our homes, or our routines. There is no getting around the fact that at some point, we each have to begin something new. If not simply the day, the week, or the year, then something even greater. Now, at the beginning, as we know, that something new is sort of a mixed bag. On the one hand, that new thing, whatever it is, holds with it the promise of something better. Something beautiful and life-giving and hopeful. While on the other hand, if we're honest, that new thing also brings with it some fear. Fear of how we are going to get there. Fear of the task ahead. Fear of the unknown. In other words, while we know it can be exciting and hopeful to enter into something new, we also know that it can be truly terrifying. Imagine the student who receives her syllabus on the first day of the semester. Terrifying. Imagine the parents who drop their child off for his first day of preschool or kindergarten or college. Terrifying. Imagine the couple who stands before God and neighbor and makes a pledge of their love one to the other. Great, but also terrifying. <laughs> Truth is, embarking on something new is always a risk. Part of the freedom that God gives us to live in this world means that we can never be absolutely sure of what lies ahead. It's risky. It may be great, and it may be not. But either way, friends, we are a people who are called to take risks. We are a people who are called to try new things. After all, we believe in a God who promised, I am making all things new, so we better get used to it. <laughs> but the good news is that although we are never quite sure of what lies ahead, we do know that we never face the future alone. And because of that, friends, we are free to take some risks. And so today, as we begin our new goal for the year, unsure of exactly what lies in front of us, we pause so that we might reflect on the task ahead as we hear a story about how Jesus faced his own new beginning. That's right, this Sunday marks the first week of our new goal for the year. For those who missed last week and were wondering why we have a giant sheep in the fellowship hall, let's remind one another about our goal. Our goal for the year asks us to work on our invitation skills and on moving our fellowship outside of this church. Our goal is simple. During this year, we would like each of you to invite someone else from the congregation to share a meal with you outside of church. We want you to share a meal with someone with whom you don't normally share a meal. It can be in one's home or at a restaurant. If it's at a restaurant, the person inviting should pick the place and each should plan on paying for his or her own meal. Also, it doesn't have to be with just one person or just with people from this congregation, and you don't only have to do it once. <laughs> once you've shared the meal, we would ask that you bring something in to remember that meal by and pin it to the sheep. It could be a picture taken at the meal, a napkin from the restaurant, a word that reminds you of the conversation, a poem, anything. We would just again remind you of the commandment against stealing. <laughs> Finally, we would ask that the person who made the invitation sign the sheep. That is our task 
ahead. That is one of the ways that we will practice feeding more sheep this year by working on our invitation skills. But as we're still at the beginning, we should probably acknowledge that there is some risk with this task. After all, invitations can be turned down. Conversations can be awkward. People can sometimes chew with their mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> there are any number of reasons that this goal is risky, but as with any risk, it also brings with it hope. Hope for a greater connection. Hope for greater fellowship. Hope for a greater purpose. And so, although we have every right to be a little anxious, we nevertheless take the risk. The good news is that we are not the first to feel anxious at the start of something new. Even Jesus, it seems, had some anxiety as he was starting out, as our lesson today reminds us. Our lesson today from the first chapter of Mark's Gospel is at the very beginning of Christ's ministry. In fact, it's basically his first day on the job. Up until this point, he's been baptized and tempted and called a few disciples. And now he's preparing to start in earnest. He's through his orientation, and now he's starting. And just before our passage today, he starts by teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath. It's not a bad way to start. Nobody could fault him for teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath. But right away, he's forced to make a decision that would come to define his ministry. Right away, he's forced to take a risk and to break the command against work on the Sabbath. And since he was in the synagogue, he was going to have to do it in front of God and everyone. We're told that a man with an unclean spirit comes to him and that Jesus heals him. Now we could stop here and have lots of conversations about how we might think of that unclean spirit, whether it was a symbol of mental illness or alienation or something else, but the point is that Jesus took it upon himself to make that man whole again without worrying about the day. Do you see? In that moment, he stepped into unknown territory. Into something new, without a clear picture of what would come from it, but likely having a hunch that it wasn't going to be all sunshine and roses. He took a risk. Not because he wanted a cheap thrill or because he needed a dose of adrenaline. No, he took a risk because he believed it was right. He believed it was right. Friends, we all take risks in life, but perhaps this is a good reminder that if we are going to take them, then we ought to do it because we believe it is right. Because the risk, the risks we take matter. They affect the people around us. In our story, we're told that all who saw Jesus were amazed and wondered who this man could be, and that his fame began to spread. In fact, even the newly called disciples seemed to have been amazed because they immediately whisked him out of the synagogue and over to Simon and Andrew's house where Simon's mother-in-law was sick with a fever. Now, maybe they had forgotten that Simon's mother-in-law was sick or never knew in the first place, but it seems more likely that they brought Jesus there with the intention of having him heal her. They had just seen him do something amazing and wanted them to do, him to do something for them. And if we're honest, we probably get it. After all, in the beginning, many of us come to the faith focused on what Jesus can do for us. Hoping that Jesus will either make our problems disappear or give us that golden ticket to what comes next. But friends,
friends, the more we live into our faith. The more we realize that Jesus has already done everything Jesus can do for us. And now it's our turn to respond to that grace with our lives. In other words, friends, our faith is not about the reward we get at the end of life. It's about the process of living itself. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. It's about living for something greater than ourselves, for God and for neighbor. Fortunately, Jesus then, as now, loves us through every stage of our faith. <clears throat> When he hears of the woman's illness, he goes to her and he takes her by the hand, and at once her fever is said to have left her. She, too, is brought back to wholeness. Now, we hear this and we are focused on the fact that the fever left, but equally amazing was that Jesus was both taking a woman who was not related to him by the hand and healing her on the Sabbath. In other words, friends, Jesus was going all in. He was committing to the path ahead, knowing that he was bound to ruffle some feathers, but taking the risk nonetheless. As the passage continues, we're told that at sundown, after the Sabbath, the whole city gathered around him and asked him to heal them and to cast out demons. They all came to Jesus looking for something from him looking for a solution to their immediate problems. And to his credit, he solved them. He brought each of them back to wholeness, but in so doing, he must have realized that it wasn't sustainable. After all, despite being the Messiah, he was only one person. And his message was not ultimately about what he could do. It was about what we could do together. So after healing and restoring people to wholeness all night, early in the morning, he sought out a place to be by himself and to pray. Do you see? Even Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, the Son of God, the Messiah, Jesus, even Jesus needed a moment to himself. He needed a moment to reorient himself to the task ahead, to remind himself of the message he came to share. Friends, this is good news for us. If Jesus needed to stop for a moment, what makes us think we don't? The truth is we try so hard to do every task we have, every task that's thrown in at us, and to do it perfectly. But we aren't perfect. None of us. Even Jesus needed a break, a moment to reconnect with God, and perhaps, just perhaps, we should follow his lead. Friends, what would it mean if before we started our new goal for the year, we each took a moment to pray by ourselves about the invitation? If we each took a moment to look around at both who we would like to invite and who could use an invitation. Friends, we are not God. We can't go on and on promising ourselves that life will slow down once we reach Thursday, or next week, or next month, or next year. No, sometimes we just need to stop. Sometimes we just need to stop. And if we want justification for stopping, and let's remember that Jesus hadn't even put in a full day's work and was already stopping to reorient himself to his mission. And thank God he did. Imagine if his entire ministry was spent like his first day, just healing whatever immediate need came to him, and he never got around to sharing the actual message he came to share. Fortunately for us, he recognized the true importance of Sabbath and used it to remind himself of why he was there. And because he did, when his disciples came to find him, he was able to say to them, let us go to neighboring towns so that I may 
proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. That is what I came out to do. Friends, Jesus went on to proclaim a message, not just heal people, for that is what he came out to do. And now, it's our turn. Now, we are invited to go out and share that same message. But to do so means facing the future together. It means taking a risk. It's true. We don't always know what lies ahead. Because we know that we never face the future alone, we know it's worth the risk. So, let's picture something new together.